Do you remember that feeling you got after watching Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull? Well, you Indiana Jones fans and Alden Indy fans might experience a similar feeling after watching this video. So let's start dissecting this thing. And thanks to Rose Anvil for sponsoring this video because our sponsor dropped out the day before this video posted. But, and that's how we pay for the videos. That's how we afford to buy these boots to cut them in half and they dropped out. But fortunately we have the scratch and dent sale going on. And because we sell leather goods, we end up with a lot of pieces of leather that are structurally fine. They're, they're just as durable. They have little teeny bug bites or barbed wire scars where a lot of people somehow forget that leather comes from the flesh of an animal and they come with flaws. So we can't sell those at full price. So we save them for the scratch and dent sale. So we've got 25% off our hand stitch wallets, which when I mean hand stitch, it's not a sewing machine. We literally take a single piece of thread, two needles and hand stitch it in a saddle sewing technique or a saddle stitch like they do on saddles because it's by far the strongest type of stitching and it allows us to use thicker thread. We also have 25% off of our handmade belts that are the micro adjust belts where you, you know, the, the problem with most belts Else is your the one hole is too tight the one holes too loose you wish you had one right in the middle the Goldilocks zone with these belts you can adjust it halfway in between each hole that's why we call them the micro adjust belts and the last thing that's on the sale that I can at least think of is the camera harnesses and the camera harnesses are really what made Rose Anvil a, a viable option for me for a career because it was the first really successful product we took this this really old antiquated designs of camera harnesses where it's just straps crossed your back and I took all my knowledge and expertise from hunting and, and the gun holsters and backpacking and put it into a camera harness and we raised half a million dollars on Kickstarter like three or four years ago. So check them out via the link in my description and thanks again to Rose Anvil for sponsoring this video. And this is the official start of the third annual Mocktober somehow where we cut apart mock toes all through October and this is by far my favorite series. Maybe it's up there with the Matusa series to be honest and we have some solid contenders this year. We got a lot of really fun sponsors, a lot of really interesting boots that maybe you guys have seen before, maybe you haven't seen before. And we're working on some cool Mocktober swag, some t-shirts and some stuff that I think you guys will like. And we just released a video on the Rose Anvil 2 channel called Everything You Need to Know About Mock Toes. It goes through all the different types of toes for Mock Toes, everything, everything you need to know about Mock Toes. So go check that out. I'll put links in the cards, the description, the comments, everywhere you can find it. So now start getting into this boot. So the history of this boot is a pretty long and tenured history. So it all started in 1884 when Alden was founded in Middleborough, Massachusetts by Charles H. Alden. From 1884 to 1930, it grew very successfully and the demand for the product was growing as rail lines and trails opened up the American West and South. In 1930, they started using the world famous Horween Tannery leather to make their boots and they still use Horween today. In 1933, Charles Alden retires. And then also in 1933, the operation moved to Brockton, Massachusetts and joined with the old colony of factory. And then in 1981, one of the biggest milestones that most people know Alden for was Raiders of the Last Ark debuts with Indiana Jones wearing his Alden 405s. And allegedly the studio wanted him to wear a pair of red wings, but Harrison Ford, who was a former carpenter, he wanted to wear the same boots that he wore as a carpenter that he loved that were comfortable. And so they let him do it. And that's how Harrison Ford ended up wearing the Aldens in uh, Indiana Jones. And soon after that, they renamed the Alden 405 to the Alden Indy boot because of the success. And then later in the 2000s, they experienced this renaissance in fashion where people started buying the Alden boots again. This heritage style started coming back and they made it through the economic recession of the late 2000s. And then 2010 up until today, they continue to employ some of second and third generation workers for Alden and continue to make allegedly one of the highest quality boots in America. But we'll see if it actually lives up to the history and the name and all the Indiana Jones stuff by starting to go through these details. So let's start with the upper first. So this is a brown leather that's either cowhide or calfskin and it's tanned by Horween, but depending on what site you look at, it either says it's cowhide or it's calfskin. So we did a little cross section test and we looked at it and, and it looks a lot more like cowhide than it does calfskin because usually calfskin has a lot less of a refined grain. It's usually a lot thinner. It's a lot more flexible and pliable because it comes from a younger cow or calf rather than a full grown cow. So my guess is this is a full cowhide leather and not a calfskin. One's not necessarily better than the other. A calfskin is a little more pliable, less durable. Calf, cow skin is harder to break in, but more durable. But if you look at the cross section of this leather, it has a lot of that blue center that we we usually see as a sign of a cheaper leather or a leather that wants lighter undertones like we saw in the, the Red Wing Oro Legacy leather where that, that lighter core kind of shows through as you start to wear it and bend it and fold it. So it's not always a sign of a bad leather. 
But what's weird about this leather is it has a super heavy pigmented layer on top where they basically have laid an entire layer of paint on top of this leather. So that lighter core, which would enable this leather to have those highlights and that contrast and that depth of color is completely ruined by putting a really thick layer of pigment or paint on top of it. But you can even see if you take a knife or just even your fingernail and scratch away at this leather, literally I'm just doing this with my fingernail on screen. You can see it's it just starts flaking off and this really bright color underneath starts to show through. The leather itself is fine, but the finishing is not great. So what about the thickness? Well, this leather is two millimeters thick, so pretty decent thickness. So if I were to grade this leather overall, because of that pigment on top, and because it's got that blued core and it's not Horween's best leather, I would put this as a B grade leather. It's right on that edge for me. Um, if it was if it were just like a, a not a pigmented layer and it was dyed, it would be an A grade leather, but the pigment just, it kind of, it negates the, the properties of a higher quality leather. And then if we move to the lining of this boot, they say it's a glove leather, which basically just means it's a thin leather that's really soft and supple and easy to work. So it's easy to put around your fingers and make gloves, but it's, it's I don't think it's a specific glove leather. I think it's just a thin pliable leather. And it, it's actually a pretty decent leather. It's, it's, it's up there with the higher quality lining leathers we've seen. It's far from the best, but it's far from the worst, like what we saw in the Lucchese's, where it's just a terrible pigskin with plastic on top that was splitting. And then if we look at the toe of this boot, so this is where that the Channel 2 video, everything you need to know about mock toes is gonna come in handy, because this is a one-piece mock toe. This mock toe stitch is strictly for the, the look and the style of this boot. It doesn't really add anything to it, but it also doesn't really take anything away. And then if we start looking at the inside of the boot, if we go to the insole, you can see we have a half sock liner in there, just a little piece of that lining leather with a little bit of foam underneath. And then you also have a veg tan insole. And this is a really odd insole because 95% of the boots that we've seen, usually that smooth grain is up. And so your foot is sitting on the grain rather than the flesh side. Whereas this, you can clearly see that's not the grain because it's kind of that uh, loose grain, that loose fibery texture of the, the underside. So either this is a really cheap split portion of a higher quality veg tan leather, or it's just reversed. Hopefully it's reversed. And then if we go to the midsole, so this is where we're gonna start seeing some problems with the Indy boot because for $610, you would expect there to be pretty much all leather throughout this boot. But this midsole layer right below the welt and, and above the outsole, it's not leather, it's a leather board. And what leather board is, it's an inferior product to, or material to leather, because basically all it is, is it's all the scraps, it's all the loose fibers from trimming off leather and grinding up all the extra bits. They take all those loose fibers and they reconstitute it with some sort of binder, usually it's a rubber compound, and they make a leather-like substance that just basically performs like rubber but it allows you to put a little bit of a marketing spin and say that it's leather board or it's, some people just say it's leather even though it's mostly rubber. It's not even as good as rubber because rubber has some properties that allow it to not split after flexing hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of time. Whereas leather board, because those fibers are on the inside, those create natural fracture points where if you really wear that material hard, those little fibers start fracturing your layer and then it starts falling apart. So it's not a bad material, but it's far from a $610 boot material and it's, it's kind of a crime to not have real leather in a $610 boot. But if we move to the outsole, this is where we start to get some unique stuff in this boot because this is their neoprene cork outsole. And it's a pretty hard outsole. It comes in at an 83 to 87-ish shore A. And these outsoles just aren't the best because this is kind of a middle zone between the, the traditional, really slippery, zero traction leather sold boots and the more traction, still slim, but has a little bit of tread like the Vibra Mini Lug that you get that flat look without sacrificing traction. Well, this one is supposed to take kind of the best of both worlds, but ends up being the worst of both because it's still super slippery because it's a flat plane. So if you step on a puddle at all, you just hydroplane out of control. Um, and it's because it doesn't have any grip, it doesn't have any texture on this at all. Anytime you're in loose anything, like if you're doing Indiana Jones stuff, you're gonna have some troubles with this sole. But it is the Alden Indy sole because so I, I kind of get why it's on there because if you watch Indiana Jones it's the exact same sole so give them a little bit of pass there but if you look at the heel so this is kind of an interesting heel and this is part of their whole gimmick with like the the foot balance where this sweeps up so it supports your arch a little bit better it gives you more arch support is it a gimmick it's hard to say 
Um, I'm a sucker for a good gimmick, so I kind of like it. But the real problem with this heel is once again, instead of using a full leather heel stack that's not even that much more expensive than leather board, they use a leather board. And it's just that same reconstituted leather that has some of the properties of rubber and some of the properties of leather, but ends up doing the same thing as the outsole where it kind of just combines the worst attributes of each. So for $610, you get rubber leather. So kind of a bummer there. And then finally to the construction. So this is a 270 Goodyear welt where that Goodyear welt stitch that holds the upper to the outsole it stops where the heel begins. Some people will say this is better or worse than a 360 Goodyear welt where that welt wraps all the way around. I think it's about the same if I'm being honest. Um, but it is a really solid construction. It's one of the most durable. It makes them easy to resole. So at least the construction is decent. So not a great start for the Alden Indie boot. Pretty disappointing if I'm being honest. There's just not that great of material so far. But it's what's on the inside that matters most. So let's cut this thing in half and see if there's anything on the inside that will hopefully redeem this boot. Okay, we got it cut in half. Let's see if there's any redeeming qualities or materials on the inside of this boot. So let's see what's inside. Well, let's, let's start with the bad first. So as we kind of suspected, this insole layer of the leather, it isn't a full grain leather that has that grain pattern that's, that gives the leather its strength when you're bending it over and over again and sweating on it and drying it out. It doesn't have that. This is from the split portion of a veg tan insole. So when they're making veg tan insoles, they usually have to split the leather down to the desired thickness. And they obviously keep the top portion with the grain in it to keeping the higher quality boots. And then usually they take that split portion and either repurpose it or grind it up for leather board or throw it away in a lot of cases. But in this boots case, they've taken that split portion. that's the cheaper, less desirable, less durable portion of the cross section. And they've sold it as a cheaper alternative to a leather insole. And so that's why it's a little bit thinner. That's why it's really fibrous. And that's why you don't see a grain pattern in the cross section at all. And it's, I still think it's a better material than fiberboard and some of these other materials, but for $610, you'd want a full grain leather insole. Another bad aspect of this boot is it's just chock full of leatherboard. You know, the heel stack is leatherboard, the counter is leatherboard, that midsole is leatherboard, uh, the rand is leatherboard. And then obviously it, I don't like the B grade leather with that heavy pigment on top. It's just not gonna age well and you can literally scratch away that top coat of paint, see? But there is some good in this boot. Uh, maybe the most important thing is that it's just an iconic boot. It's known as the Indiana Jones boot. It's got this long history, but that's about it for the good, if I'm being honest. Like there's some decent materials and stuff, but not for $610. So are they worth the money of $610? not even close and to prove to you it's significantly overpriced this is built basically the same way as a red wing boot that's half the price and if you compare this to other boots in its price range of the 600 dollars and up range where you get to these whites and these nicks there's no comparison between these it's it's a tough argument to make to say that these boots would cost the same amount as a nicks or a whites or any of these guys that really make handmade boots in the u.s so overall remember what i was saying at the beginning about the indiana jones and the crystal skull remember when they re Revived the franchise after 20 years and it seemed like all the things that made Indiana Jones movies so fun and exciting and manly had just been removed 
and replaced with a bunch of big budget Hollywood BS and CGI and it just became a shadow of its former self and barely resembled what made the franchise what it was. Well, it's, it's the same story with this boot and it's just this beautiful irony that the, they follow the same path. This boot probably started off as a high quality, well-made boot, but over the decades, they've slowly replaced the high quality materials with lesser materials piece by piece until it became a, cra a cash grab, relying on nostalgia and the name of their brand to sell this bloated, overpriced product. And it's a huge bummer when these well-established American-made brands do this kind of thing. So if you, if you bought a pair of Alden Indies and you paid more than $300, you should, that should probably bother you. And I think you have the right to be annoyed at Alden for s selling this boot for $600. So it's, it's not necessarily a bad boot, it's just a severely overpriced boot. And if you think I'm off on this, prove me wrong, because I'm not opposed to being wrong, maybe there's something I missed, but let me know specifically what you thought I got wrong. But I'm pretty confident that this is by far the most overpriced boot that we've ever cut apart. And love working next to mechanic shop. So let me know what you think. And uh, if you have a pair of Aldens, do you feel like they're worth $610 or do they feel like more like a $200 boot? And Mocktober begins. So thank you guys for supporting this series and I'm excited to do this series. It's gonna be really fun. And we, we got two awesome series. We got the Matusa, the Mocktober. We got, some, we got a lot of cool stuff coming. So thank you guys so much for everything. It's what allows us to spend $610 to show you that you're paying twice the price you should for, for footwear that's made in the United States. And I love doing this, so thank you guys. See ya.